a situation where it, 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 it blends. There's references to Ivan. So I think you're starting with Ivan and then moving on to the forms. Did you put in your lunch over there? Let's go, everyone. Let's go. Let's all be walking to the gym. Let's go. Back to the gym, yeah? That's right, yep. How was uh, your seminar? That's fantastic. Good, I good. really, really enjoyed it. And then afterwards, Miles. Aaron Miles, yeah. Uh, that was He's in my uh, human letters class, is he? Yeah, I've taught him several times. He was in my ninth grade class. And then, uh, I don't think he was in my econ class, but yeah, he's in my 12th class. Well, he came up yeah. said, thank you. I mean, I, I did. Yeah. Try, try not to speak. Sure, sure. No, that's great. Yeah. Good, good. Awesome. Let's go, y'all. No, but I'm not hungry, but thank you. Coffee's good enough for me. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, how did the uh, discussion go? Good? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for doing it. Oh, great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Come on, students. Uh, well, for for you, yeah. yeah. Um, no, some of the right questions now might be good, but uh, you don't need to bring the book necessarily. You don't have to. You know, yeah. We just reserved it for the It's the best rose. I know. Good break. How did the uh, discussion go? Really? So, what's the weather like there at the Good. Okay. Good. That's awesome. You and the family. So. Come on, y'all. Let's go. That's so cool. Did um. Did what? All right. So you just feel it. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. It's a great here. Mm -hmm. Need to make Nelly. a reminder about not spilling coffee. Oh. Oh. It's okay. It's all right. Um, Were they okay. serving coffee out there? Hey, did James Crabs? He'll be here. He did. I was supposed to meet him in front office, but maybe maybe he couldn't do it. I will see. Oh, yeah, that's, it is on. Okay, here it is. Uh, hey, it's funny that in my office today, too. I was taking my mail. I had a brochure about Ron Jackson. I think it was a classic institute. It was all about a talk. Yeah, it was all about a talk to do there. It's pretty cool. I, that. I want to get involved in that stuff. So keep me on your way. All right, uh, good morning, again, everyone. Uh, a couple of notes here. So uh, there was an outline as you came in. If you did not get one, which I hope everyone did, but you did not, just raise your hand and someone will come and, and bring it. So, Mr. Navarrette, could you sure. help out with that? Thank you. Also, uh, following our keynote address, we will have some time for questions and answers. So, as our speaker uh, is delivering his address, pre please note any questions you want to ask uh, so that we don't forget by the time the talk is over and the question and its time comes to fruition. 
Well, uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Owen Anderson to you all. He teaches philosophy and religious studies at ASU's New College of the West Campus. He has published seven books, including The Declaration of Independence and God, The Natural Moral Law, with Cambridge University Press. His areas of research include epistemology, the ethics of belief, intellectual history, and the problem of evil. Presently, uh, he serves as the faculty senate president for ASU's West Campus, and in this role, he conducted research on the importance of studying the humanities at the collegiate level, and as I understand it, he plans to share some of his conclusions with that study uh, with this, this morning. Apart from these uh, impressive accolades, Dr. Anderson really is a model of what it means to live the intellectual life. His research and teaching so clearly means more to him than status or livelihood. The examined life for him remains constant beyond his office desk or lecture podium. We are so thankful for his years of friendship to this academy and are glad to welcome back to actually his second symposium. Yes, I said second, and I actually found a relic to prove it in the deep, dark cavern of the Alexandrian Library, really just a cubby. Uh, I found this, you just had a bunch of these. This is a 2013-14 uh, symposium annual when Dr. Owen Anderson was our keynote speaker and talked to us about Cicero. So we welcome him back. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium, Dr. Owen Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here today. And we have some excellent readings to go over together. Let me see, make sure, does this sound good? Is this right? Okay. Now you have a handout that is uh, available. I hope you've gotten a copy and you can kind of follow along. It's sort of an outline of my presentations and there's some spaces there where you can make notes. And um, as Mr. Withers said, I'm visiting from ASU, where I teach philosophy and religious studies. And I especially teach uh, philosophy of religion and epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. What does it mean to know? The general topic for our talk today is this question, why study the humanities? With a, maybe a subtitle of the humanities and meaning. Is there any relationship between the humanities and meaning? And we're going to see how this relates to the readings that we're working through. It's very directly. These are um, excellent works of art, but they also uh, serve this purpose of illustrating why we study the humanities. So for me, this topic came up in a couple of ways. I've been especially studying this question about the humanities this year. I'm the faculty senate president for ASU West. And as part of that office, my duty is to complete a research assignment and they assign you the topic. Mine was to look at ways that humanities graduate students find employment outside of teaching. In other words, right, what is a humanities graduate degree good for besides going into teaching? So this is a very practical question and it can be studied by following the progress of students after graduation. There are so many, only so many teaching jobs and so you're gonna have to, students that go into other professions. What do they go into? But it really raises a larger question about the study of the humanities altogether. It's uh, related to a practical question of what job will we do with a humanities degree. And what I'm going to argue for here is that the study of humanities is to find meaning. And we find meaning by using reason to understand the nature of things. And we'll see how both Hopkins and Tolstoy bring this out. That means as we approach the humanities, we're assuming that we can know and this assumes that some things are clear to reason. And it'll become more clear what I mean by that as we continue. Now, I've been interested in this question for a long time. Before I was given this assignment, I attended Wickenburg High School up the road. And I was introduced to the great books there. And we really did read some wonderful literature. I still remember the discussions we had and particular books that stand out to me even since that time. I was introduced to art. 
and as we will uh, as we will be today. And the art displays for us the individual, and through that individual takes us to the universal. So what this did for me was introduce me to human questions that I wanted answered. Although my education raised these questions, I noticed that they weren't being answered. I noticed that many people asked these questions and I felt, and they felt confident in their answers, but they didn't actually have knowledge. I didn't just want belief. I didn't just want a true belief. I wanted to know. And so this started me on the road of studying these questions in the academy. Really, it's sort of in philosophy where we ask that other question, not just what answers are given, but how do we know? So I've always held the humanities in high esteem and was eager to think about the benefits of studying them. Now, it's common to find posters in philosophy departments about the kinds of jobs a person can get with a philosophy degree, trying to make sure philosophers aren't just viewed as layabouts or uh, the future unemployed. So you'll find uh, persons with philosophy degrees can get jobs in the following areas. And it's also made news in the last few years that some colleges and universities are cutting humanities majors. University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point was a, a, a national example. So this led me to a Stanley Fish article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Stanley Fish is a well-known uh, professor of philosophy and English, postmodern writer. And he had an article last summer titled, Stop trying to sell the humanities. Arguments that they're useful are wrong, anti-humanistic, and sure to backfire. So in this article, he considers some of the most common arguments to motivate students to pursue a humanities degree. They kind of fall into three kinds. It will help you get a better job. It will help you be a better citizen or it makes you into a better person. The idea that it will help you get a better job, we can analyze that empirically and see if it is indeed true. Say you want to go into business, to, does it get you a better job than if you had an accounting major? The claim that, and, uh, and we can, it also does another thing, it reduces the humanities to a means to some other end. For example, money or comfort. You study the humanities to get a good job, to make lots of money, so you have a nice house in which to die. The claim that it makes a, a better citizen or somehow is necessary for democracy is really contrary to some of our Central American ideals, which is that there, everyone has a kind of common sense or access to common sense. Probably read that book by Thomas Paine. Or they are able to know what is needed for a virtuous life. And instead, it's suggesting that academic elites know best and should tell the rest of the population how to live. And the idea that this study makes you a better person uh, to that, Stanley Fish said, remember he's a professor of philosophy and English, whoever thinks he'll make you a better person hasn't spent any time around philosophy and English faculty. So why study the humanities? It might seem like I'm trying to dissuade you. Uh, really, we can ask this broader question, why study? Right? Why study humanities is a subset of the larger question, why study at all? And we study to know things. So what kinds of things we want to know and why do we want to know them? We make distinctions between uh, the kind of things we want to know, perhaps saying some are more relevant to our ends and some are less relevant. But this requires we have known the end that we ought to pursue. So we can also make the distinction between basic and less basic. A belief is less basic or not basic when it has presuppositions. We can work our way back to our most basic beliefs. And we can do this in all the disciplines we study. For instance, we begin with uh, numbers, not with calculus. And we begin with the ABCs, not Tolstoy. So this is a familiar process, is how all of education is laid out. Now, I've already mentioned an example above. Uh, we want to know what is good. And this gives us two basic questions. How do we know and what is good? And they're linked to another question, which is what is real? because what is good for a thing is based on the nature of that thing. We want to know what is real, what is, and from there to what is good. We want to know what is real so we can pursue what is good, as opposed to pursuing a fiction or a fantasy. For instance, uh, ASU's catalog describes Philosophy 101 as studying what is knowledge, what is real, and morality, or the good. So this is one, Philosophy 101, those three questions. 
And the humanities studies these three basic questions in the, in the different areas. We distinguish the humanities from the natural sciences, where the natural sciences study the laws governing the material world. The humanities study the human condition in all of its expressions. Uh, th that, I'm studying, that I'm focusing on the humanities today is not by any means meant to suggest the natural sciences aren't equally worthy of study, but just simply to distinguish them, and this is my own area, attempts to reduce one of these to the other, say to reduce humans to merely being a material object, or to reduce the material world to an idea, fail as the reality of each resists and prevents this kind of reductionism. So these are two uh, real fields of human study. The humanities are a study of human nature and the human condition. And there's an element of these studies that we do not find in natural sciences, which distinguishes them. Say, for instance, in the medical sciences, you might say, look, we're studying humans and the human condition. And, and that's part of the natural sciences. But what we find in the human sciences, which the, the medical doctor wouldn't study, we find the moral element, the reality of choice and human nature that is not found in the study of the natural world. We'll see this come out uh, in a couple of the poems. The contrast Hopkins makes in, for example, Windhover. And this is what we'll be looking at here in our reading selections. So what does it mean to be a human? What is the human condition? And specifically, why do we suffer? And how can we make any sense of our suffering? Is there any meaning in life? And that's why I said the subtitle could be the humanities and meaning. Something happens when we begin to ask these questions. We quickly begin to see our need for meaning, for understanding. Now this word meaning can mean purpose. And we see it studied this way in the natural sciences. What is the purpose of something? But here it also means understanding or cognitive content. We're pursuing meaning when we ask what something is. And this illuminates its relationship to reason. Reason as the laws of thought is that by which we understand. We make distinctions to understand. We dis for example, we distinguish between A and non-A or human and non-human, good and non-good, God and non-God. And when we contradict ourselves, for instance, we say that A is non-A or human is non-human or God is non-God, we lose meaning in the sense of the term. The cognitive content is gone. So these are connected, our use of reason and finding meaning or understanding. When we study the humanities, we're using reason to study humans, including their lack of consistency in using reason and the consequence of this. We'll consider in our readings attempts to get around this in concrete examples from those texts. And really these come in only a few forms of anti-reason. These are non-cognitive in the sense that they attempt to bypass beliefs in their attempt to avoid reason. Instead, they might emphasize the practical, as we'll see Ivan did throughout his life, and live in an uncritical manner, assuming he knows what works. Or they might be more mystical and emphasizing an experiential acquaintance or awareness. In either case, these cannot be articulated or explained without then stepping into the cognitive and forming beliefs about what works or what is the object of mystical experience, and thus using reason to try to understand. And part of what we'll look at with Ivan's life is what did it take to get him to do that? What process in his life uh, was, at, uh, was operating, was at work to get him to stop and think? We might think that the avoidance of reason could go on forever in a given person's life, and in, indeed it might. Another poem from Hopkins, which we didn't include, says, there is no worst, none. It can get worse. There is no reason to think that someone who denies reason will ever begin to do so over their own, uh, on their own accord. It's just the opposite. If someone is denying reason, then they cannot reason their way to seeing why they need reason. They may be in the continual, self-referentially absurd state of giving reasons to justify their doubt and denial of reason. This is the awful inconsistency of the human condition that is a kind of death. And so we see Ivan wrestling with, that's all ask you to think about when and what is the death of Ivan Illich. You say, oh, that's easy. That's when his heart stops. Well, I want to challenge you and see if that is his death or not. Death is when something is no longer functioning. 
We usually just think of this in terms of physical death. Our body stops functioning. But dead bodies still exist. In fact, we have to properly dispose of dead bodies. It could be very expensive. But what we see is that there is another kind of death. Our mind can also stop functioning. Just like a dead body, our dead mind still exists, but it hasn't found meaning or understanding. And this condition of meanlessness is abhorrent, and people do all kinds of things, short of actually using reason to start thinking, to dull and numb the reality of meanlessness. Now, what is meaningless is boring. Meanlessness and boredom go together. And the tension between our ability to use reason and our own failure to do so without anyone else to blame brings with it guilt. So we have these three as we could call spiritual death, meanlessness, boredom, and guilt. And I think you'll see all of them working in Ivan. Now, uh, notice how meanlessness is the consequence of not using reason, it is when we fail to make basic distinctions or even deny there are any basic distinctions, it is a denial that anything is clear to reason. By way of contrast, when we see what is clear, we understand and have meaning. And this is why understanding is described as light and ignorance, meaninglessness, boredom with darkness. So you think about Ivan's turning point and how it's described as light. We might even say we have a fear of there being nothing clear because we see this results in the denial of meaning. It results in nihilism. If we cannot know, we cannot understand. And this includes that we cannot know anything meaningful. So the reality of spiritual death is a central part of the study of the humanities and is a condition that the person denying reason cannot get themselves out of. But it is a condition, the human condition, that raises the problem of redemption. How will we go from denying reason and spiritual death to using reason and a life full of meaning? It isn't through self-help, and it isn't merely a matter of needing a coach to show us the way. The guilt involved shows that there is also need for redemption. We were given something and we wasted it, and now we're in debt. How will, this, how will we be brought out of this debt, and how will that debt be paid? Sometimes it's called atonement, and we'll see how this appears very directly in the Hopkins poems and in Ivan's death, how Tolstoy illustrates it. But really, we'll see it, it is a story about Ivan's life. Because we are guilty, we cannot earn this redemption, and that's why it is called grace. This returns me to a question I asked a moment ago. What will get us to stop and think in the condition of not thinking? In our poems, in our short story, we'll see that it's natural evil that gets them to stop and think. Natural evil is all forms of suffering, and it's a callback from moral evil. In the condition of moral evil and its consequence of spiritual death, we would never stop to think. Natural evil is imposed on us. It interrupts our life as a callback to stop and think. Isn't that what it does for Ivan? If we had no moral evil, we would have no natural evil, which means if we have natural evil, we have moral evil. And it is this realization that Ivan resists so strongly. It is this process that Hopkins describes in Carry and Comfort. And before we turn to these texts to illustrate the points, let me again address the question of the humanities. Why study? Why think? Why try to understand? The alternative is to not think. We can see two characters who do this. This could be the simple life, like the simpleton. One of your favorite shows, or at least the favorite shows of the Americans, is about a family of simpletons. It might just be that a person wants to pursue a pleasant life and hadn't given it much thought. Is that Ivan? It might be uh, the simpleton says, Knowledge is not needed for a good life, and so there would be no reason to study, especially the humanities. The simpleton doesn't know and doesn't care to know. Or the other character is the fool. The fool believes he knows, and the fool is blinded by pride. There's an ontological pride where we put ourselves in the place of God, and this produces an epistemological pride where we think we know and we don't need to seek. God knows all things and doesn't need to seek out knowledge. So when we put ourselves in the place of God, we have that epistemological pride that we don't need to seek. And we'll see examples of this uh, in both the poems and Tolstoy's story. 
Neither the simpleton nor the fool have any need for the humanities, and their life is like chaff, a word that Hopkins uses. It's barren, it has no fruit, nothing comes of it, and it's quickly destroyed. The alternative is what is exemplified in the Socratic dictum, the unexamined life is not worth living or is less than human existence. To aim at excellence is to aim at understanding. And in art, we study that individual excellence and what it expresses about the universal. This is how the distinction mentioned earlier between the humanities and the natural sciences is united. As humans, we use reason to understand the nature of things. This includes the nature of things in the material world. We'll be considering examples of this in Hopkins' uh, poem, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. And the nature of things created reveals the nature of the creator. This is what Hopkins asserts. The glory revealed in the natural world, the excellence there, is a re revelation of the glory and excellence of the creator. And so we have united here the role of God the creator and God the redeemer. And Hopkins uses a specific word for that, I'll leave you to think about it and then we'll look and see, he's uh, explicit. If the humanities or someone claiming to teach us the humanities cannot teach us these things, then the humanities aren't worth studying. As you go on in your, your uh, education, you'll have the opportunity to choose where to study next. And in that choice, you'll have to ask if the persons you're going to study with are wise or not, do they know these things? Or since the humanities do reveal these things, these, these meaningful things, it is the supposed teacher of the humanities who cannot show us what is clear that should be exposed. What is important is not the finding of a place to get a diploma so you can get a job. That's a different discussion and it, it is important in its own way. What is important for studying the humanities is to find someone who knows what is clear about these basic questions and who can teach you. The student cannot, arrive the, cannot arise above the, mat, the teacher, the master. So uh, this is true of the teachers at Simpleton, if the teacher is a fool, or if the teacher has wisdom. And that last term is the one we associate with understanding what is good and the fulfillment of the humanities. And the first time I'm introducing it here, I introduced Socrates, and if anything comes to mind about Socrates, it is the uh, pursuit of wisdom. And it's the very word, uh, or in the word, of the subject I teach, the love of wisdom. It's the fulfillment of the humanities, the capstone. The fool and the simpleton will not recognize the wise. Indeed, one of the easiest ways to identify a fool is that he scoffs at or mocks the wise. So those who put themselves in a place to teach without themselves knowing the basics have to go back and learn those first things. There are a few things more harmful than someone who puts themselves in a place to teach without knowledge. You have to avoid such as these while seeking out the wise teacher and then learn all you can from that person. This really describes the uh, life of Socrates, looking for such a person. Test those who would claim to be your teacher. As you go on to college and they want to teach you, this is what you can test them on. As you're evaluating colleges, I don't know they get that question very often. Are you wise? They probably want, how is your job placement for your degrees, right? So you'll stand out in the interview process. Are you wise or do you only think you're wise? No, I'm, I'm not actually recommending that question, but that's the spirit of it. So you can test them in that sense uh, ask them if they know or they only think they know. Now, life will test us, and we're going to look at this in Tolstoy's description. Is it the death of Ivan Illich or the life of Ivan Illich that we're studying? But first, let's look at the Hopkins poems. What I want to do here for each reading is uh, look at some of the key ideas that will help us both with the question, why study the humanities, and also aid to deepen our discussion later today. Now, I'm going to consider the poems in this order, spring and fall, first. And I'm assuming you've read all of these and also the short story, so I'm not going to read through them. I do have some quotes from them, but mainly I'll be making comments about them. So spring and fall to a young child. We see here a, a dedication, and there's one other poem that also has a dedication. I'm going to make note of to whom are these dedicated. Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove unleaving? Leaves like the things of man you, with your fresh thoughts, care for, can you? Now think about how these themes illustrate what we just discussed. The title itself, Spring and Fall. Hopkins was British, so uh, the British usage is autumn. 
He doesn't say spring and autumn. He says spring and fall, the American usage, because this also reminds us that this is about the fall. The human condition involves a fall. It involves both moral and natural evil. And we yearn for the spring, the restoration of life, both the original spring that the young Margaret intuitively is aware of, and also the restoration to that spring from redemption. So here we find this yearning in a child as leaves die. And there's a kind of innocence to that that the older person doesn't even pay attention to. When you see leaves die and you think, oh, I got to get the rake out. This is awful. Uh, you think of some practical concern. And it strikes her, the concern is that they're dying. But this ultimately points to her own death. It is Margaret we mourn for. She is not yet uh, aware of that. The older person is. And that's a more significant death than the leaves. And the reason why is in this innocence, she has this intuition that death is strange. Death is not of the ordinary course of things. We were not created to die. Natural evil is imposed on a world due to moral evil. The fall, right? Spring and fall. And natural evil makes us ask why. It asks us to stop and think. The question is, uh, will we press through and try to answer this question to find meaning? Or will we settle for something less? And the next poem makes this even more personal, carry in comfort. No, I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee, not on twist, slack they may be, these last strands of man. Now, why not despair? What would you call it, going emo? <laughs> why not give in? He calls despair carrion comfort. It is animal comfort or dead animal comfort. It is less than human. It indulges the flesh. To be human means to reject despair, even as we cannot seem to understand. It's that tension. He can't yet understand, but he won't despair where we see his humanity. To despair is to reject understanding or say it is impossible to understand. But we cannot be human and do that. That would make us into the animals. That's how the animals live. This meanlessness, he describes it like chaff. Chaff is the uh, leftover dried grass, perhaps after mowing or after uh, harvesting wheat. It's not the fruitful part that you want. It's the leftovers that you toss out. It's worthless. It's fruitless. And this condition cannot uh, merely be a matter of circumstances. What the poet sees is from God. Why has God done this? Lay a lion limb against us, he says. The concern is to find meaning. It is this why, not merely to solve the problem and get out of it. You might say to him, oh, take some aspirin, you'll feel better. Some practical advice. That's not his concern in the poem. Why would God permit this? And uh, all the more, if this is Hopkins in the first person, a priest. Why would God act this way against someone who's dedicated their life to God. So we want to ask this why question. A solution would have to reconcile the sovereignty of God with the reality of natural and moral evil. And he does this in the poem. He says, the author kisses the rod of discipline and the hand who holds it. Not merely a discipline, but recognizing, submitting that God is bringing this discipline. This is... I would guess very consciously taken from Psalm 2. Kiss this uh, rod of the Son of God, lest you provoke his anger. Or from the New Testament, that God loves those whom he disciplines and chastises those he calls a son. So here we have the poet reconciling these in the poem. It is not only to avoid despair or to avoid suffering, but to find joy itself in the meaning of the suffering. In this, he is wrestling with God, another reference. But not just that Jacob did, but that he is wrestling with God. And none of us will avoid this. None of us will escape this. Hence the uh, value of this poem, like a, a rare gem. Each of us will do that. Not just Jacob, not just Hopkins, each of us. In the next poem, we find an elaboration on this meaning and this joy. So it goes from fall and the reality of death to the deeply personal wrestling, to in uh, Kingfishers, 
We see Hopkins in his description of the individual, the nature of a thing. And the nature of a thing being what it is in its excellence, it displays a kind of glory. The kingfisher, I, as I understand it, is the most uh, colorful of the birds in England. And the way the light strikes it, it illuminates that glory. We'll see how each thing, the next poem, Windhover, it has a different excellence. You might say, oh, it looks plain. And so we'll see what its excellence is. And he gives visual and audio examples of excellence, each thing being what it is. Remember uh, the earlier comments, studying what is, what is real. And so here we have in the poem, and this is what art does, especially poetry as a kind of refinement of literature, gets to that individuality. And Hopkins is the master of that. So he, he moves from these uh, studies in, in the nature of or the natural world, these examples, excuse me, the examples he gives, he moves to the human, to the self, living according to its nature. The natural being, the kingfisher, acts without a kind of thought, but the human introduces the moral dimension and displays the glory of God as the image of God. So he says, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places. So the uh, humans are a revelation of the image of God. And here we have introduced now in this poem, and then we'll see it in the next one, the term Christ. He speaks of Christ displayed in human nature. And again, paying attention to the use of the words. For any poet, that's important. Uh, and he picks this term Christ, the Greek for anointed one, as opposed to the Hebrew Jesus, maybe more familiar uh, as savior of his people, or the Hebrew Messiah for anointed one. And by choosing the Greek term, it reminds us of how Christ is introduced as the logos in John 1, the word of God that makes God known. And that's what Hopkins is displaying here, the word of God as the light of man in reason, and the word of God as the Logos is found in the creation, although the creation did not know it. So the word of God makes the Father known through natural excellence and through human nature. So again, uh, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. And then finally, the, la the fourth poem the wind hover. This one, just like the first one had a dedication, so too this one has a dedication. To Christ our Lord. Now the last poem introduced Christ, the anointed one. Now he introduces another title or attribute. To Christ our Lord. Lord is ruler. And he's going to describe a ruler in the beginning. The wind hover rules in expressing its nature. He is master of all. What the wind hover does is he is able to basically hover in place in the air waiting for uh, his food. And it's a kind of excellence. It looks effortless. How does he do this with no effort? Imagine how hard any one of us would try to flap our arms to stay in one place in the air. And this bird does it with no effort. It is like uh, he is the ruler of a kingdom, a dolphin. He's riding on his, uh, the wind as his steed. So he's master of all, and he seems to effortlessly take dominion. Just after dedicating the poem to Christ our Lord, he then describes these things. This is not accidental. Poets are not uh, purposeless. This points Hopkins to his own chevalier, the slow, deliberate plowing. He describes the, the chevalier as the, the knight or ruler having dominion, and then he describes the slow, deliberate plowing that breaks the soil but also displays its excellence. And he says, the fall, gall, gash, gold, vermilion. And that theme, the last line of the poems we're looking at, that theme of through plowing, bringing out excellence, through discipline, the discipline of natural evil, bringing out excellence. And he had, in his uh, caring comfort, seen that process and submitted to that process and even kissed the hand. So the poet says, Christ rules in suffering, rules effortlessly like the wind hover as the word of God, making God known. So some very explicit themes there. 
Hopkins moving from the reality of the human condition under natural evil to the personal and excruciating wrestling with this and the joy that is there in coming to understand, to seeing the glory that is revealed in the nature of things and what this reveals about God, the creator and redeemer. Now, these are also what we find in the life and death of uh, Ivan, although the uh, Hopkins is explicit in a way that we might have wished Tolstoy to be, but we'll see he's explicit in all the ways he needs to be. So let's look at some examples. I'm assuming, again, that you've read the story, and so my comments will be somewhat of an outline, and you can connect them up. You can remember how it goes. I do have quotes in here to illustrate the points. So as you know, the story begins with a chapter after the death of Ivan. We see how his family, friends, and co-workers process his death and attending a funeral. It's an obligation, a nuisance to some, and mostly brings out self-centered concerns. When will you play cards? How hard was it? Uh, on you when he was dying, and will you get the right pension? Peter, uh, as well as the others, really no one, accepts the human condition. Death is treated as a misfortune to others and a hindrance to our own life, but not something that will happen to you. So Peter thinks to himself, three days of frightful suffering and then death? Why, that might suddenly at any time happen to me. And he thought about this for a moment and felt terrified. But he did not, know, did not himself know how. The customary reflection at once occurred to him that this had happened to Ivan Illich and not to him, and then it should not and could not happen to him. The only person that did uh, exception is Gerasim, who says to Peter as he goes out, it's God's will, we shall all come to it someday. In chapter 2, we turn the chronology of Ivan's life. He begins with all the hopes of youth. Do you know about the hopes of youth? And he quickly becomes vain. Have you heard that word before, vain? Vanitas vanitatum. It's okay to use Latin here. And it, this is a word that Tolstoy specifically uses. He is pragmatic and sensual. That word sink in. What is sensual? Our youth, do youth, especially the temptation to be sensual. And he finds meaning in pleasure and seeks a life of pleasure and a job and a family that will give him a, what the phrase is, a pleasant life. Would you like a pleasant life? Raise your hand if you don't want a pleasant life. I didn't think anyone would. So it says, all the enthusiasms of childhood and youth pass without leaving much of a trace on him. He succumbed to sensuality, to vanity, and latterly among the highest classes to liberalism. Oh. And he accommodates immorality in order to preserve his pleasant life. It says, at school, he had done things which formerly seemed to him very horrid and made him feel disgusted with himself. But then later he saw that such actions were done by people of good position and that they did not regard them as wrong. So he was not able to exactly regard them as right, but to forget about them entirely or not be troubled about remembering them. So you can see the deadening of his conscience as he gives in to doing things that are wrong. And you can slowly kill your conscience. That might be an important part of the death of Ivan Illich, is as he kills his conscience. Natural evil and suffering, uh, we see it before his fall. Two times, you need to pay attention to, that he ignores natural evil. So if you, if you ever wonder, why does that have to get to this point? Well, it didn't have to. He had a natural evil before this, and he ignored it. It's first imposed on his life in the form of marital strife. And it's interesting that it is in this area of life that he's first conscious of natural evil. I mean, he had it before in his life. He'd seen others who had died. But this is when he becomes aware of it. Marriage was supposed to be pleasant and add pleasures of life. He married out of a, a sense of social duty because this is what you do at this age. But he notices suffering when it interrupts his pursuit of what he thinks is good, a pleasant life. And this is uh, when he begins to respond. Natural evil does elicit a response. Natural evil had been all around him but he not noticed it until it became personal. Nor does this natural evil make him consider his own moral evil. He considers the trouble his wife is causing, doesn't think about his own contribution. Instead, he stops and thinks only about how to minimize the impact of the strife on his pursuit of pleasure. So natural evil makes us more consistent. We will either be more consistent in our denial of reason or in our use of reason. And natural evil presses our self-deception about ourselves and our condition and we'll see how Ivan's self-deception comes out more and more, as well as the self-deception of those around him, especially his wife. He throws himself into his work to avoid his wife. That's the only 
uh, excuse she'll take. Well, I have to go to work, and she wants the paycheck also, so she uh, understands that one. If you would have said, I want to go play cards with friends, that's not acceptable. So natural evil breaks these uh, in him, self-deception. A person cannot remain unmoved when they encounter natural evil. They'll either go deeper into darkness or repent and begin to use reason to shed self-deception. And it says, very soon, within a year of his wedding, Ivan Illich had realized that marriage, though it may add some comforts to life, is in fact a very intricate and difficult affair towards which, in order to perform one's duty, that is, to lead a decorous life approved of by society, one must adopt a definite attitude towards, one own, towards one's official duties. His next encounter with natural evil is in his personal life. So we'll have two, two encounters with natural evil before the fall. Oops. Before the fall, and that fell, is that poetic, right? The, the individual falling of the uh, staple is emblematic of the universal. So here, uh, this comes up in his personal life, and this is what he had turned to in order to avoid his wife. So it's interesting. To avoid the suffering with his wife, he turns to his personal li or professional life, and then suffering comes up in his professional life. He's not getting paid what he wants, and he's being bypassed for raises that would give him a better salary. Others have let him down. His job has let him down. He cannot get enough money to satisfy his desires, and he cannot indulge himself as the way, in the way he wants with his salary. So the solution he finds, remember the solution with the wife was go to, work, go to your job. Now he doesn't have enough money. The solution is get more money as opposed to learning what is truly good. So it says this was in 1880, the hardest year of Ivan Illich's life. It was then that it became evident on the one hand that his salary was insufficient for them to live on and the other that he'd been forgotten. And not only this, but that what was for him the greatest and most cru cruel injustice appeared that others appeared to others a quite ordinary occurrence. Even his father did not consider it his duty to help him. So this is the most important thing in his life and others don't care. They regarded his position with a salary of 3,500 rubles as quite normal and even fortunate. He alone knew uh, that with the consciousness of the injustices done to him, with his wife's incessant nagging, and with the debts he had contracted by living beyond his means, his position was far from normal. So in order to save money that summer, he obtained a leave of absence and went with his wife to live in the country. And it's interesting, an interesting word is introduced here. His first awareness of meaninglessness comes in here, and it's introduced with the word ennui, which especially has to do with a lack of satisfaction uh, due to lack of excitement. So ennui is not, it's, it's a, a source of meaninglessness for him because he's not having the kinds of excitement he would want, which he could get with more money. So he's still not connecting up his suffering with his failure to know what is good and the spiritual death of meaninglessness. And it's in the country that he comes up with a solution. He goes back to see if he can uh, get a certain job. And he does. And they move. And he's purchased this house. And now we have the third instance of natural evil, which is the one that does lead to his death. But see how he had ignored the first two, right? Once, when mounting a stepladder to show the upholsterer who did not understand how he wanted the hangings draped, he made a false step and slipped. But being a strong and agile man, he clung on and only knocked his side against the knob of the window frame. So in chapter 3, we begin the uh, story that leads to the end. So the suffering begins slowly. He's had time to reflect already, and he hasn't. His only concern is uh, whether to ignore the suffering because it will get better or to seek medical help. So these are just a desire to get past natural evil as quickly as possible and get on with the pleasant life. He is not yet hearing natural evil as a callback. He does, not, he does no introspection. He notices that others treat him as a patient, just like he treated clients in law. It was a kind of professional attitude. And this is also the first mention of popular religion in his life. We don't have religion mentioned much at all, uh, just two times. Popular religion sets aside the concern for truth and instead focuses on psychological and practical needs. Ivan overhears a story, a woman telling a story about an icon that had been healing people. And he initially is interested, and then he chastises himself. Am I really becoming that stupid? He says, one day a lady acquaintance mentioned a cure affected by a wonder-working icon. And he catches himself and says, have I really weakened to such an extent? It's nonsense. It's all rubbish. So as the suffering increases, he begins to think. He can no longer keep his thoughts on simply getting past natural evil. 
It gets worse and worse. He wonders about his own mortality and he can barely fathom that he is mortal. And he has this old syllogism. Uh, in our part of the world, we use Socrates, right? All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. See how you, you get these two premises and you can't help but pop out the conclusion. That's how inferences work. That's the beauty of logic. And for uh, uh, Ivan in the Russian world, it's Caius. Caius is a man. Men are mortal. Therefore, Caius' is mortal had always seemed to him correct as applied to Caius, but certainly not as applied to himself. That Caius, man in the abstract, was mortal. This was perfectly correct. But he was not Caius, not an abstract man, but a creature quite, quite separate from all others. He'd been little Vanya with a mama and a papa, with Mitya and Velodya, with the toys, a coachman and a nurse, and afterwards with Katenka and with all the joys, griefs, and delights of childhood, boyhood, and youth. What did Caius know of the smell of that striped leather ball Vanya had been so proud of? Had Caius kissed his mother's hand like that and did the silk of her dress rustle so for Caius? Had he riot like that at school when the pastry was bad? Do you riot when the pastry is bad? Had Caius been in love like that? Could Caius preside at a session as he did? Caius really was mortal, and it was right for him to die. But for me, little Vanya, Ivan Illich, with all my thoughts and emotions, it's altogether a different matter. It cannot be that I ought to die. That would be too terrible. So he is in this suffering alone. Others only think of it as it affects them. They cannot pity him not in the selfish way he wants and not in the real way that would show actual concern. The kind of pity he wants is another kind of pleasure that he seeks. He has not yet uh, let go of his view of the good life. He says, apart from uh, the lie or because of it, what most tormented even Illich was that no one pitied him as he wished to be pitied. And incidentally, just because you've probably read this as well, that's also what gets to Richard III. And if I die, no living soul will pity me. And he wrestles with his own mortality. And as he wrestles with his own mortality, he becomes aware that others are in the same position that he was in of not accepting the reality of death. He calls it a lie. They do not want to hear the callback any more than he did. From them, for them to understand it as real would mean that they must deal with natural evil as a callback, and they will not do that. So they engage in self-deception together. This is what suffering in Ivan's life has been piercing through. His self-deception is no longer sufficient but others are engaged in their own self-deception, and to do this together requires lying together. When the self-deception is questioned, they engage in self-justification. We see this with his wife throughout, and especially in her discussion with Peter at the beginning of the story. Her concern is her own comfort, a pleasant life. She has not heard the call back. There's a lie they all agree to accept. What tormented even Illich most was this deception, the lie, which for some reason they all accepted. Now, finally, he begins to ask some basic questions about his life. Natural evil has pierced through self-deception, and he must look at himself. He has this dialogue. What do you want? What do I want? To live and not suffer, he answered. Why to live as I used to, well and pleasantly? As you lived before, well and pleasantly, the voice repeated. And in imagination, he began to recall the best moments of his life. But strange to say, none of these moments of his pleasant life now seemed at all what they had seemed then. He comes to see that the pleasant life he'd been pursuing is a fantasy of his own making. It is not real. Remember, that's one of the basic questions. What is real? And he does not have knowledge. He cannot defend his own beliefs, and they have left him. When we don't have knowledge, what happens is it is fleeting. It's not lasting. Our beliefs aren't lasting. And it's very important that he's going to be, use this word defend because he, as a judge, that was his career, right? Does the uh, accused, can they defend themselves? Perhaps he's been wrong all this time, and this is too awful to consider, but why is it? This is just what he should be considering. Look how much natural evil it's taken for him to get here. He could have done this at the very beginning when he was tempted to vanity and then to moral compromise, and he didn't. That's the fall. He could have done this when his strife with his wife first emerged, the call back. He could have done this when, in his professional life, when it was not satisfying, when he did not have enough money, when he experienced ennui. So look how much it's taken in his life to get an otherwise very capable individual to rise to the level of judge, he's very capable, individually to finally ask if he has lived the wrong way. So here's what he says. Then what does it mean? Why? 
It can't be that life is so senseless and horrible, but if it really has been so horrible and senseless, why must I die and die in agony? There is something wrong. Maybe I did not live as I ought to have done, it suddenly occurred to him. But how can that be when I did everything properly? See what it took to get him to ask that question? Are we any different? Will you ask that question when you should at the temptation, or will you wait for this great suffering? Well, that's only Ivan, though, not us. Not Caius and Socrates, or just Socrates and Caius, not us. He is confronted now with the greatest pain in the story. I'm sort of declaring this, but it would be a good question for it to test you on. What is the greatest pain he suffers? The physical pain is what occupies most attention. Now he finally focuses on spiritual death. The greatest pain is that perhaps there is no answer, no purpose, no meaning. And all this is horrid and meaningless. And that is too awful even to consider. It is hell. He says, then what do you want to live? Live how? Live as you lived in the law courts when the usher proclaimed, the judge is coming, the judge is coming, the judge, he repeated to himself. Here he is, the judge, but I am not guilty, he exclaimed angrily. What is it for? And he ceased crying, but turning his face to the wall, continued to ponder on the same question. Why and for what purpose is there all this horror? But however much he pondered, he found no answer. And whenever he thought the thought occurred to him, as it often did, that it all resulted from him not living as he ought to have done, he at once recalled the correctness of his whole life and dismissed so strange an idea. That's what it's bringing up. That's the, the worst part is that perhaps it all had no meaning. Look at how it connects up this meaninglessness with no reason. No reason in these, uh, in this case means of no purpose, but also of no sense, no understanding, no meaning. And no reason means there is nothing. Nihilism. That's the worst pain. When we deny reason, we end in nihilism. And it has taken natural evil to give this into focus for Ivan. He says, why these sufferings? And the voice answered, for no reason. They just are so. Beyond and besides this, there was nothing. So Tolso here through this is connecting up that if we can't understand, we end in nihilism. Now he begins to connect this increasing intensity of natural evil with his own increasing spiritual death. The physical, there's a, a, a symbolic relationship between the physical and the spiritual. The physical death increases as a callback from the spiritual death. And there are only, there are these two senses of death and, or in even's death, sorry. He's been dead this whole time, hasn't he? The death of even Illich is not at the end of his life. He's been dead and this approaching physical death calls him to stop and think about his spiritual death, which has been there, a condition we see him and from the start. He says, just as the pain went on getting worse and worse, so my life has grown worse and worse. He thought there was one bright spot there at the back at the beginning of life. Incidentally, it's interesting, it's, it's before that temptation he describes where he did moral compromise. The bright spot is before that. Remember again from spring and fall, this idea of the uh, original uh, good condition. There's one bright spot there at the back at the beginning of life and afterwards all becomes blacker and blacker and proceeds more and more rapidly in inverse ration, ration to the square of the distance from death, thought Ivan. So the only explanation, the only solution is understanding. It is to make sense of this, to, make, to find meaning, just as in caring comfort. The only uh, solution is that direction, in that direction, is that he has not lived the life he ought to have. He has to accept that first to move towards meaning. But that requires repentance of an entire life of false beliefs, self-deception, and self-justification. He would have to take responsibility for having done all this. There is no one else to blame. He says, there is one possible explanation. Resistance is impossible, he said to himself. If I could only understand what it is all for, but that too is impossible. An explanation would be possible if it could be said that I have not lived as I ought to have, but it is impossible to say that. So he's wrestling. Every time we see him wrestling, He's wanting to understand, and he can't. That was the same thing in carrying comfort. His mental sufferings were due to the fact that that night, as he looked at Garrison's sleepy, good-natured face with his prominent cheekbones, the question suddenly occurred to him, what if my whole life has been wrong? It is finally when he can accept that he has not lived as he should have that he begins to make sense of life of his life. He can no longer defend himself. He sees self-justification for what it is, a continuation of the lie. He has believed about the goodness 
uh, and pleasure, all that he has believed about goodness and pleasure has been false. And what a realization. What did it take to get there? Are we any different? What do you expect out of life? You're on that, that uh, original good side, the early side, the youthful side. Will you have a pleasant and easy life or will you need to suffer? Notice also that he comes to a point where he says that he has no defense. This is part of his past legal training. He cannot defend how he lived. That's really the turning point for him when he confesses that. He embraces the question, maybe I haven't lived as I ought to have lived. That's step one. Step two is, and I have no defense for it, no excuse. I'm without excuse. He is culpable, guilty. His life has been chaff. So he says, he tried to defend all those things to himself and felt the weakness of what he is defending. There was nothing to defend. So in general, his pragmatic, pleasant life had not required popular religion. Popular religion seeks to keep our self-deception and self-justification in place while giving psychological comfort. Early, when he heard about miracles, he rebuked himself for listening. Now he engaged in a, a ritual, last rites, and it provides initial psychological relief. But it's not lasting. It is non-cognitive. It is an uninterpreted experience and has no meaning. And that is what has been the problem all along, lack of meaning. Adding more meaninglessness to, will not be the solution. So popular religion only masks the doubts he has, but doesn't answer them. He says when he laid him down again afterwards, he felt a moment's ease and the hope that he might live again awoke in him. So notice how popular religion turns him to the idea he might physically live again. He began to think of the operation he had had and suggested to himself to live. I want to live, he said to himself. His realization about his entire life having been lived the wrong way grows as the physical pain grows. He's um, sitting with his wife and says, this is wrong. It is not as it should be. All you have lived for and still live for is falsehood and deception, holding life and death from you. And as soon as he admitted that thought, his hatred and his agonizing suffering again began to spring up. And with that suffering, a consciousness of the unavoidable approaching end. And to this was added a new sensation of grinding, shooting pain and a feeling of suffocation. Now, we'll see just after this the use of the term light. This is the standard image for understanding. Not only has life not been what it should have been, and this is through his own fault, and he can repent. Now, he is or he is now able to start thinking about what he is the right thing to do. And look what it took to get him there, all the suffering it took. It says, at that very moment, Ivan Illich, through the captive sight of the light, I wonder if I missed a word there, and it was revealed to him that though his life had not been what it should have been, this could be rectified. He asked himself, what is the right thing? and grew still listening. Notice how Ivan's wrestling with the three questions I began with, right? What is good? What is? What is real? His life hasn't been. Notice the timing and the drama here. He's coming to these at the end. Will he have enough time before he dies to answer them? Did you feel that drama and the pace of the story? His last spoken word is to repent, to ask for forgiveness. And who is he asking? He doesn't say it all the way, right? He says, he tried to add, forgive me, but said, forego, and waved his hand, knowing that he whose understanding mattered would understand. So his repentance here is before God who understands it, not before other humans. Now, we might want Tolstoy to go into this more, to tell us more about what Ivan experiences as he dies, especially the other side. But that is part of the very problem Ivan has needed to overcome, and Tolstoy does not indulge us. He gives us what we need, and it's what Ivan needed. It is the important part of this whole story. The death of Ivan Illich was the source of his life. Or, Ivan has been dead from the beginning, but physical death was a callback to stop and consider his spiritual death. So he, remember, he, he used uh, Newton, uh, the law of gravitation, to describe this. He was, in the beginning, dead. And the closer he gets to his physical death, the more inversely related to that he becomes alive, right? So in place of spiritual death, there is now light. He understands. Spiritual death is finished. It is no more. When he says it is finished, could he be referring to physical death? He's not finished. He's not yet dead, and he's going to be dead. He's referring to another kind of death. It can't mean physical death since he then dies. The power of physical death is gone. 
It served his purpose. He is now alive. It says he sought his former accustomed fear of death and did not find it. Where is it? What death? There was no fear because there was no death. And yet he is still physically dying. There is not this other kind of death. In place of death, there was light. Death is finished, he said to himself. It is no more. And we know the reference there, right? Tolstoy is not as explicit as Hopkins is. I don't know. That's pretty explicit, isn't it? It is finished in his redemption, in his asking for forgiveness. That uh, redemption is finished, is completed. So notice the role of God here. He is present in the entire story and yet never directly mentioned. Only reference at the end as the one to whom uh, we uh, repent and who understands our asking forgiveness. This means it is God who provides redemption, and God is the one who has used natural evil to get Ivan to stop and think, just like carry and comfort. God has not been silent, hidden, distant, or aloof for Ivan. He's been present through his whole life. God has been there from the beginning of the story, actively involved in Ivan's life. Uh, you think about the active involvement from his fall, when he says he turned to this uh, immorality, and from that time in God disciplining Ivan, just like in carrying comfort. And what it took for Ivan to finally get to this point. And we can ask that of ourselves. It forces us to ask that of ourselves. The uh, work of art forces us to apply that to ourselves. Will we see it? Will we see it any sooner than Ivan? Are we any different than Ivan? So by way of conclusion and summary, the uh, works of art we're considering today have laid bare to us the human condition as part of answering that question, why study the humanities? And this is ex especially expressed in the reality of suffering and our need to make sense of it. There is a lot that the humanities study, but you'll see how they continually come back to the problem of evil, of suffering in their various areas, whether it's philosophy and they look at the logical problem of evil, very dry, compared to the literary study, where it's very alive, in the, looking through a person. We see uh, this found in the excellence displayed in the nature of things and how we have not understood what is clear about them. How, how often have you uh, passed by or passed under a bird hovering in air like that and not considered it, not noticed the beauty in the natural world, the study, and, and it's like, not just beauty, but the excellence. Uh, not merely a kind of non-cognitive appreciation of beauty, but a cognitive appreciation of the nature of things. The study of the humanities brings us to the human condition and the nature of things. We begin at the beginning with basic questions. How do we know and what is real and what is good? And if the humanities cannot answer these, if the humanities teach that nothing is clear, then they really don't have any value, do they? They are meaningless. But if the humanities affirm that some things are clear, some things are clear to reason, and then among these are the good and the meaning and suffering. Then they're the source of our greatest joy. The study of the nature of things reveals the nature of their creator, and the human condition includes both natural evil and moral evil. It is the fear of the consequences of moral evil, meaninglessness, that is the beginning of this study, the beginning of wisdom. We can test those who sit in the chair of the humanities to see if they are wise or they only think they are wise, if they know or they only think they know. And that's what you can ask about a degree program as you go on to college. Not only how do your graduates do getting a job, but are you wise or do you only think you're wise? We study the humanities because we love wisdom and we want to know what is good. So when you're considering where to study, you will need to find someone who knows and who can teach you these same things. Now, we'll have time for questions. You get to see if I know or I only think I know. And I'll get out of that from the beginning by saying uh, what, what I've come to see is that uh, although I don't know things, at least I know when I don't know. Is that a good way out of it? Is how Socrates got out of it? I'll repeat it.
Yeah, so the question is, towards the end of his life, Ivan's having this internal dialogue. Was that God? Um, it certainly is at least in response to God's acts in his life, right? What it reminded me of was his, the, before his fall, he, had, he, he does things that he, knows, he thinks are wrong and does them because he notices other people that he thinks are good do them. Um, so he has that first violation of conscience. And then it doesn't seem to reappear in the story until this, these dialogues you're mentioning. Now it comes back. So that's another example of life and death. You can kill your conscience by acting against your conscience. And it, without that, what, what warnings do you have? So I wonder, um, conscience, voice of God, uh, I don't know if, we, if I would say like it's God speaking directly in that sense as opposed to this is God-given internal dialogue. I, I think that would be right. And it's due to uh, his conscience and reflecting on this call back finally. Yeah. Um, before Ivan reaches the light, he's described as being pulled into like a black sack or yeah. um, a black hole. How would you interpret that? So before Ivan does see the light, he's being pulled into a black sack or hole of some kind constricting. Um, I think it probably has a, a physical and spiritual component. So in the, the, uh, it reminded me of grave or death clothes, you're wrapped up, and also the loss of motion in death, but also that it's darkness. So it's contrasted with when he comes to the light, that in his physical death, he also has this spiritual death. And once he comes to understand after and in repents, that's when he says, where is death now? Where is the power of death? So the, the, the power of death is in sin. And when sin is dead, death no longer has that power. So that's how I understood the, the, that black bag he was getting put into. Yeah. Um, what causes spiritual death? Like, is it inevitable, like the physical death? Or is it just... Yeah, good. So question, what causes spiritual death? So this could be kind of a question about the individual. So, for instance, in Ivan's life, we, we see this description, this point where he does, it, well, we see the description by Tolstoy when he says uh, he gave in to pleasure and sensuality. So that might be describing his fall. And then from the first person, when he's wrestling with his conscience and he violates his conscience and does things that he had, been, he had thought were wrong before. So we have those examples, and after that, uh, he, he gets into spiritual death. Those are kind of the artistic or bio, biographical descriptions. But it could be, in another way, that he's born dead. So you have this interesting dichotomy between being born. It's like when I became alive, you celebrate your birthday. Some people celebrate their birthday every year. It's like, come on, you've already celebrated it last year. you got to do it again. Right? And you celebrate when you came alive. And um, you might have been born dead. So in the, in the description before I got to the artistic uh, texts, I was describing it as the rejection of reason to understand basic questions. So we could ask, did we begin doing this, or were we just born into a condition of not having done that? So, for example, um, when someone asks this question, what must I do to be saved? The very famous response is, you would have to be born again. And the person who's told this answer takes it literally, as most people do, and they say, oh, I'm an old man. How could I enter once again into my mother's womb? Confusing spiritual and physical uh, birth, right? And so we have this image of when, what's the cause of being uh, born dead? Since we have the uh, image of the fall in both the poem and this, you could say, what if there was this original fall such that the whole world, Margaret just finds leaves falling. The leaves don't fall because of something she did, right? She's born into a world where leaves die. So someone else did something. That's what the poem gives us. But then at the same time, in the description by Tolstoy, Tolstoy or uh, Ivan does things that result in it. So sometimes in theology, the distinction is made between original and actual sin. Lest anyone ever say, it's Adam and Eve's fault, you can point to what is called actual sin. Say, oh no, look what you did. Uh, you did the same thing. So I don't know if I've directly answered the question, what's the cause? Like the cause was that one time you cheated in seventh grade. That was your fall. I haven't done that so much as kind of describe what the condition is. Because I don't know that we're looking for necessarily 
a chronological description, although that is what is healthy about uh, self-assessment. That's what Ivan's forced to do. Look back on your own life. Can you identify the things Ivan did in your life? Wouldn't that be a fantastic uh, work? You could, people would read that for a very long time if you wrote something that was kind of like a confession, right? Or maybe it's multiple. You call it uh, the confessions. And it's a process of looking back on your life and thinking about these very similar things. And you can contrast uh, those confessions with what, what would an Enlightenment figure do in his confessions? Would he start out by saying, look how good I am? I'm going to show to God and the world how good I am. And contrast that with Augustinian confessions, which are the opposite of that. So you can contrast maybe, we have, this would be a good, I'm, I'm handing out senior papers topics. Augustine and Rousseau through Tolstoy. Is that a good title for one? I have a website where I sell papers if you want, oh yeah, uh, if you want to visit it, you can. Just joking, for the record, just joking. Yeah. Any, uh, yeah, off the record? Uh, go ahead. Uh, during your speech, you had mentioned that uh, Ivan went through a phase of doing uh, popular religion where he tried to gain psychological comfort um, and how this was detrimental to his yeah. spiritual death. Yeah. Uh, how is, is this something you often try to avoid? Is it good? It's, uh, and how, I guess, how should you avoid something like that? Yeah. Given, given that it seems so convincing. All right. So the question is about popular religion and how Ivan encounters it two times in the story. And what does it say about religion? And should we avoid, how do we avoid that? Or should we avoid that? So I think it's interesting for anybody reading this. Given what we know of Tolstoy's religiosity and what we know of Eastern or Russian Orthodoxy, how silent it is about these things. Um, the focus is on his suffering and his desire to overcome it. So I, I think it's brilliant from the artistic perspective what he puts in there are the things that capture Ivan's attention. That there's a miraculous icon handing out healings. That captures attention. He's just been going to doctors. He wants to be healed, Right. And then he only does religion at the end because initially his wife insists on it. It's not going to hurt you at all. Do it for us. Right? His last rites. And that's what often happens in this form of religion is that it, it, we could use the word magical perhaps. If you go to this, if you say the right words, then you will have a good outcome. Maybe it's called being saved. And saved means from natural evil. And that gets projected into the future world as well. The afterlife is mainly thought of as avoiding suffering and having a pleasant life. Wouldn't that be nice to have a pleasant life? You can't have it here, but if you say the right words, you'll have it there. And that's precisely why Marx calls it the opiate of the masses. And I think we could view that as a, a, a derogatory term and want to fight back against Marx, but he might just be doing it as a description. As a matter of fact, people suffer. And what, what does the doctor give you? Hopefully, opioids, right? Uh, and what does, but, but that only helps out with this life. What about the next life? Well, I got religion to cover me there. I got opium in this life and religion for the next life. I'm good to go. And the problem that Ivan's facing is his need for meaning. And so just like opium does not help us get meaning, especially it's, it's the purpose of opium is to shut down your mind. You go to an opium den and they're just zoned out. So in that sense, this kind of religion is not about religion altogether. This kind of religion shuts it down, right? So that's what you want to avoid. And it could be religion, politics, sports, anything that shuts down the desire to know why. Law did that, his career did that. His career in law could have made him think about these things his whole life, and he didn't. Here he is day in, day out, dealing with legal issues, not thinking. So I think it's a very interesting part, both that and that people want Tolstoy to tell us more, like almost like uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead describes all the things that happened to you in detail. Give us the Tolstoy Book of the Dead. What happens to Ivan? And he purposely doesn't do it because that is the very kind of thing that Ivan wants, some kind of comfort. Tell me what will happen so I'm comforted. And he tells us what we need to be comforted, which is that we need that meaning in life. So when religion goes against that, and it is not meant to be an indictment about any particular religion, in his case, of course, it's Russian Orthodoxy. It's not some particular indictment against that and avoid that. And if you just stay within, uh, if you're just a Southern Baptist, you'll be fine. That's not the point. It could manifest in any context, right, of shutting down this question of why. Yeah. Yeah, you, I, I saw your hand first. I'm going on firsties here. No, no personal preferences. You gotta be loud. 
A little louder. I'm so old. <laughs> Mr. Madison, you might have already answered a question similar to this when I was um, gone. Oh, yeah. My question, but is it reasonable to assume that the ending of this book, Full Story, is, is similar to that of like a... Is it reasonable to assume that the ending symbolizes a more spiritual baptism? Is it reasonable yeah. to I mean, so the question is, is the ending of the Tolstoy piece, is it, is it a kind of baptism? That's a good image to bring up. I mean, it doesn't come up in an explicit way, but baptism uh, has that uh, symbolism of needing to be washed from sin or born again. And it is for the Christian what circumcision was in the Old Testament, the need to be born again. Moses says, circumcise your hearts, not your flesh. You could be circumcised merely in your flesh and not have experience the actual purpose of it and so too for the uh, christian and baptism so it comes up uh not not baptism but this idea of a, a last rites comes up in the story but yeah i like that idea um not of the sign of baptism but the reality of baptism going from death to life oh yeah go ahead Yeah. From this way of thinking, so is it something that's different about Ivan? Good question. Or is it specifically only his death? So the question is, yeah, the question is, uh, everyone, no one else seems to go through the, the process Ivan goes through of coming to see the lie. Everyone else accepts the lie. What is it? Is it something different about Ivan? Well, the one thing that stands out is no one else in this story is suffering the way Ivan does, right? So interesting this way, you might begin the story, I think this is in Carrying Comfort also, why does God hate Hopkins? Why does God hate Ivan? And what do you come to find out? It's just the opposite. Why does God love Hopkins so much? Why does God love Ivan so much? And that's not our natural intuition when we see the leaves die. When we see natural leaves, our natural intuition is with uh, Monty Python to think a huge foot has come out of the sky and stepped on you. That's ancient college humor. And it's not by way of recommendation, just reference. Uh, we think of uh, natural evil as God not loving us. And so here we see it, that's why I mentioned Psalm 2 and also the book of Hebrews, uh, the discipline of God and how Hopkins describes it. So I don't mean by that because your follow-up question might be, well, why does God love Ivan more than others? I wish I got to suffer that much. But not that so much as just a description. Um, I, love, I love this phrase, right? The pleasant life. Wouldn't you like the pleasant life? A nice car, a nice house, the right type of vacations. You could keep up with some, I don't know, just any family. Keep up with them and have beauty. Would you like beauty? Is that part of the pleasant life? An attraction? And what's so wrong with that? That's what someone will say. What's wrong with these things? Now you're, you're condemning cars just because you're an angry philosopher who who uh, wasn't able to buy anything but a 20-year-old Honda Accord, doesn't mean the rest of us <laughs> can't have nice cars, right? Really nice cars in some cases, right? Yeah. Um, when I think of this idea of the life, life being peace and pleasant, Garrison has, uh, doesn't have that. What's his role? In yeah, good. I'm glad. I didn't touch on him much besides at the beginning, but the question of the role of Garrison, and I only referenced him at the beginning, in comparison to everyone else, he simply says, this is the way of all of us. And he has this kind of common sense role. He's not educated like Ivan. He's not uh, at high level of society like Ivan's family is. But he uh, has a kind of authenticity about him because of that and hasn't accepted the lie. So that connects up with your question just now as well. Uh, he's the other person who's different. Everyone else, but there's Garrison and Ivan. And he hasn't accepted the lie is what stands out about him, right? I mentioned that at the beginning, that one of the answers of why study humanities is it makes you a better person or a better citizen. And that's a kind of elitist view that many professors in the academy have. They, they view themselves as able to tell everyone else how to live. And it's contrary to uh, the founding ideas of the United States, right? Which is there are some truths that are self-evident that everybody can know. They're common sense. 
right, that we have access to. So yeah, I think of him as that kind of not, as especially being in contrast to the lie. He has never bought into that lie. And, and incidentally, just for Tolstoy himself, he tends to have those figures, the natural man, unspoiled by society, the Russian peasant is who he especially uh, lifts up. And it's an interesting contrast because the Americans have at their time in that same time in their literature, a very similar idea of the person unspoiled, natural, the farmer or someone like that in contrast to the city, which um, ruins us and makes us evil. Your hand, second row. I'm just going with who I saw first. Yeah, it's a good question, and it brings up a question about what the word reason means, because someone could hear, sorry, and, and the question is, I need to repeat it, is, is Ivan's process a kind of logical process? Is his problem that he wasn't logical enough? And he has to return to that, and, and sometimes the word reason could be heard that way, but reason and logic are different. Logic is the science of and study of inferences, whereas I'm using reason just to describe that by which we understand. And those don't always go together. Someone could be highly logical and not very rational in this sense. For example, Spock. He doesn't, he doesn't get much. And, he, and that's where Kirk comes in. Kirk gets it most of the time and Spock doesn't, but Spock is logical. So I think what the art does, I, I mentioned at the end that philosophy studies the problem of evil in that logical way you're describing. And it doesn't connect in the same way the art or the literature does precisely because of what you might be getting at which is it doesn't seem like what Ivan needed was a kind of lecture in philosophy earlier in life and he would have been fine. So I wouldn't call that so much as a, a existential solution, which is a combining, there is the rational side of understanding what's going on. He's not content with a non-cognitive, just the acquaintance. Um, it's not as if he just needs to see some kind of vision and he'll be okay. That would be back to popular religion. So he does want to understand, but it's in connecting up the problem with his real life suffering, which I, I don't think a, a kind of dry abstract would, whereas the, the art starts with the practical, the, the individual. Um, so in that sense, I guess I'm saying, no, I don't think he just needed a lecture in philosophy, but it is impossible in the text to, to, to avoid the fact that what he's asking for is understanding, because he says explicitly, if I can't understand this, then I end in nihilism, nothing. I needed to understand this. Okay, you were so... Uh, Excellent. All right. Um, so my question is, what is the flaw that man has that um, allows him or makes him neglect his eternal consciousness in which, he comes to, or in which man comes to understand the nature of God? Okay, so the question is, what flaw is there in uh, humans that they do neglect reason and understanding what they should? So I think it's somewhat related to an earlier question, what's the cause of the fall and it's a good question, is it a flaw? I'm not sure I would initially say it's a flaw in this sense that it would be impossible for humans to be created unchangeable. Insofar as humans are created, they're changeable, they're either growing or declining. So to say change is a flaw, and I hear that a lot, I hope people say, well, I'm only human. Um, but to change is not a flaw or a problem. That will always be true of all of us, we'll always be growing, can learn more even even when you're a, a doctor professor at ASU, you can learn more. I know it's stunning. Um, so that's not the issue so much as what happens when they're left in their self-life? What will they choose? What will humans choose? And that's, I think, how it's described very well by Tolstoy here. He's in, uh, he has this desire for a pleasant life coupled with being around others who are pursuing it in a way that he initially thought was immoral. But he goes along with it. So left to himself, he is changeable, and he chooses that path. Um, I don't, so I don't know that it's a flaw. I'm questioning that part of your question. Is it a flaw? And here's why. If you say it's a flaw, who are you really blaming? God. I, I, I guess my question is more not flaw, but what's the truth about man that is kind of scary to 
Yeah, okay, good. So the truth is that doesn't this describe, I mean, look, I'll put it in the uh, vernacular. Isn't, to, isn't Ivan trying to keep up with the Kardashians? <laughs> right? <laughs> and is that any different than the rest of us? Society. And we'll see that, you'll see that in uh, War and Peace, you'll see that in uh, Anna Karenina, you see Russian society in a certain way and how it affects the individual. And that would be true for us as well. That's why I use that reference, that it's not just the Russians and the pleasant life. And um, what it does, it warns us, this could be an example too of what you might take from Augustine's Confessions, it warns us about our own human condition. The purpose of the Confession is not to read it and say, what a dummy, I never do those things, right? The purpose of the Confession is, is to take some application and say, uh, there go I as well, right? Are we, aren't we, that's why I've asked a few times in the, in the uh, presentation, aren't we the same as Ivan Illich? Or we should hope we are. We should hope we're not Peter, right? Or who is the other guy? Uh, Swartz, right? We should hope we're not him. We hope we're Garrison or we're uh, really uh, Ivan. All right, now I'll be around the rest of the day. So I know there's a lot more questions. I'm very sorry I didn't get to all of your hands, but I'll be around and I hope you'll, if you see me, you can ask me a question. It's $5 per answer. I'll listen for free. I'll answer for five dollars. All right, folks. So uh, now, at the time, I know you've been looking forward to. What? No, <laughs> uh, so I do want to just say thank you so much for your uh, attention respectful behavior. Uh, I know it's a long time. Uh, 